Hi, my name is Craig Richardson and welcome to Mind to Heart. In this show, we take a journey from our logical, critical mind to our heart center where real transformation can occur. My guests help us understand our journeys by telling us about their past and the lessons they've learned along the way. Last weekend, we officially passed into spring with the equinox, although it might not seem so depending on where you're located. It's also a signal that the holiest religious holidays of both Judaism and Christianity are now upon us. In fact, Easter is set to fall on the first Sunday following the full moon that comes on or after the vernal equinox. So there's a tie in there. Holy Week begins with a celebration of Jesus's triumphant entrance into Jerusalem, where he's mounted on a foal and is greeted with crowds waving palm branches and singing hosannas. It was a time of great anticipation that positive change was now coming. The long awaited Messiah had finally arrived. Yet by Friday, Jesus is arrested, betrayed by one of his own 12, and everyone except for his mother, Mary Magdalene, and best friend, John, St. John the Baptist, desert him. He's left to die on, on, on the cross, as, which is saved for the worst of the criminals. All seems lost until Easter morning when his disciples check his tomb and find the stone rolled away. He is risen is the cry of, of Easter Sunday. There's a lot to unpack in the story of Jesus's final week of his public ministry. It's steeped in theology and most of the foundations of the Christian faith emerge from the events of Holy Week. It also represents the archetype of the hero's journey, which my shows are all about. When all seem lost, the hero, Jesus in this case, is able to escape death and is now an inspiration to billions around the world more than 2,000 years later. With me today to sort out the richness of Holy Week, and in particular what it looks like in 2021, is my good friend, Dr. Robert Moynihan. Bob's journey, like mine, began in New England, he Connecticut and me Massachusetts. He earned his BA in English, magna cum laude from Harvard, and an MA and PhD in medieval studies from Yale. He founded a magazine inside the Vatican nearly 30 years ago and spends his time traveling between Rome and the US when it's permissible, as well as dedicating a great deal of his time to the reunification of the Roman and Eastern Orthodox churches. He's had a front row into the tremendous changes, both good and bad, that have occurred over the last 40 years, particularly within the Catholic Church, as well as Christianity and formal religion in general. Bob, welcome to Mind to Heart. Well, thank you, Craig, for inviting me. It's great to see you. Um, as I as I mentioned in the intro, so so we have Holy Week coming up, and in a way, we it can almost be seen as as a metaphor for Christianity in general, for where it came nearly 2000 years ago, for where it was today, it had a triumphant period, certainly was very important in the founding of, of Western civilization and, and other uh, other impacts. Yet it seems like we're entering in a period where we're now, maybe we're at Wednesday, Thursday, potentially even a good Friday now with 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 the church and, and, and other former religions. So can you Tell me, you know, what your sense is on the state of, of Christianity in general uh, at this point in the church in particular. Okay, Craig, you're right. Uh, our church has passed through a triumphant period, and I'm going to cite the Catechism. It's a, it's a book that summarizes the church's teaching, and it was produced, the new version was produced in the 1990s under Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger and promulgated by Pope John Paul II. Came out in 1992. And it talks about the church's ultimate trial in paragraph 675, and I've called it up here so I can read it to you. Before Christ's second coming, the church must pass through a final trial that will shake the faith of many believers. This is in the Catechism. The persecution that accompanies her pilgrimage on earth will unveil the mystery of iniquity, in Latin, mysterium iniquitatis. The persecution that accompanies her pilgrimage on earth will unveil the mystery of iniquity in the form of a religious deception, offering men an apparent solution to their problems at the price of apostasy from the truth. The supreme religious deception is that of the Antichrist, a pseudo-messianism 
by which man glorifies himself in place of God and of his Messiah come in the flesh. Now, I've been working also with uh, this famous Archbishop, Carlo Maria Viganò, who also shares this view, although he's not managed to conclude that this actually is the end time. He does think that it's a time of great trial with aspects that refer to this, this test. Uh, and we know that this comes often, so we don't know if this is the final one, but the next chapter of the Catechism says, 676, the Antichrist deception already begins to shape, to take shape in the world every time the claim is made to realize within history that messianic hope, which can only be realized beyond history through the eschatological judgment. The church has always rejected even modified forms of this falsification of the kingdom to come under the name of millenarianism, especially the intrinsically perverse political form of a secular messianism. What that means is that every human political or social or religious movement that says the kingdom will appear here due to our science, due to the power we have over nature, or due to some type of class war or race war that we will carry out uh, almost pitilessly against uh, those who cannot participate in the kingdom is all false. And it starts so clearly in this Holy Week narrative that you summed up nicely at the opening of the program. All of Jesus' disciples were hesitating as they attempted to understand who he was and what he intended to do, what kind of teacher, what kind of king he intended to be. It's my belief that he was the actual descendant physically of King David. And the book of Matthew and uh, the scriptures say that both Mary and in a different line, Joseph, were both descended from King David. So he actually was the heir to the throne of David. However, he ended being executed. But his disciples thought when he went into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, which is this coming Sunday, that he would take the kingdom, that he would be declared the king of Israel. But the, their biggest, I think, excuse me, their biggest uh, mistake was, and we see that played out in the trial when when Pontius Pilate says, "Are you a king?" and he says, "I'm not a king of this world." And so, it wasn't it wasn't the biggest mistake that they were looking for a messianic kingdom that was going to come in with an army behind it and start throwing the Romans out? I mean, they misunderstood who he was from the beginning. Absolutely. So they were with him for months and years, and they still didn't understand. And the moment that most graphically characterizes that is when he speaks with Peter, and Peter says, "Lord, what are you doing?" or master, what are you doing? He said, I'm going into Jerusalem where I will be handed over and I will be executed. And Peter said, no, Lord, you, that must not happen. And Jesus says to Peter, get thee from me, Satan, because it's a temptation to avoid that. And then he says, you will deny me, Peter. You will say that you never even knew me. You will deny me three times the night that I'm arrested before the cock crows the following morning. Peter said, never will I deny you. And perhaps in my, in my judgment, the most dramatic scene in all of the New Testament is when Peter hears that third, because the, 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 the women standing around one of the servant girls says, weren't you with him? I think I saw you with him. Yeah. And I don't, I don't know the dude. <laughs> never knew him. And then it happens a second and a third time. They says, you definitely were with him. You even have an accent like a Galilean. That's the group that was around him. He says, no, no, it's, you've got, you've mistaken. And the cock crows. And the passage in scripture says, Peter heard the cock crow and he remembered the words. And he wept bitter tears because he realized that he was a, a betrayer himself. And that's the first Pope. And in a sense, it's the model for all of us that he could first betray and reject what he never intended to betray and reject, but then he could repent and return and become in a sense faithful and loyal. 
the founder, the first pope. But uh, this whole process raises the question, is this kingdom a, a, a dream? Uh, is it pie in the sky? And the communists used to call it the opium of the people. And the first response I have, are you interested in this question? Yeah. The first response I would have is no, it's the most real and the most true and the most powerful. But people don't easily recognize it because our minds are rather earthly, earthbound, timebound. This, this is a matter of eternity. And everything that falls short of eternity is unworthy of man. According to the Christian and Jewish belief, man is made in the image and likeness of God. God is an eternal being. We are in his image and likeness. All the church theologians and philosophers speak about this. They say, man is a great mystery. He obviously is a physical creature with a body, lives in time, dies, and disappears, evidently. At the same time, he has an eternal longing. He speaks of the infinite. He speaks of the things that are transcending the, vag the, the, the uh, changeable qualities of time. And I would say every one of us has that moment when we sense that, yes, that is part of us. It's part of our being. I would say that that's really what drives our journeys, I think, to continue on in these in these the sort of some way endless cycles of holy where we have good times and then it seems like it's all lost and then it comes back again so i think that's really that that particular thing what you just described is really what makes us human i think yeah actually i i once heard the definition of man is that being who is not himself unless he transcends himself oh, Which, well, that... that's a paradox but if we yeah, just if we just accept let's say bread and, uh, and, and wine and, and then daily life, which, which of course is blessed and beautiful. But if we live only by bread alone and not by the words that speak of eternity or the words that speak of truth, the words that come from the mouth of God, Jesus said that one of his famous sayings, man does not live by bread alone doesn't mean we don't need bread and we don't need physical life, but man does not live by that alone, but by every word that issues from the mouth of God. Now, this is another mystery. And how do we access these words and which words are they and which do we? Well, I think that's, we're going to take our first break. And I think that's a good place to stop because what I'd like to get into when we get past, after the break is exactly that. Where do we get, where do, we, how do we embrace that Easter Sunday? Because I do think we've been through a you know, pretty good trial here, but I also see signs, you know, of, of hope and in, in, in signs of increased spirituality. I mean, I mean, form religion. So why don't we get into that sort of Easter Sunday topic when we get back after the break? Hi, welcome back to Mind to Heart with your host, Craig Richardson, and my guest, Dr. Robert Moynihan. If you'd like to get a hold of Bob, he, uh, as I said, is the founder of Inside the Vatican magazine. So that's insidethevatican.com. And my website is craigerichardson.com. Bob, welcome back to the show. Uh, when we took our break, we were sort of segueing from sort of that good Friday, and there still is a lot of shaking out. Uh, but I think there's, there's hope as well. And you talked about humanity's sort of inbred desire to transform itself into really a divine. And there's a lot of that going on. But I think the irony is that the institutions themselves, that in, in the Catholic Church's case would be the Vatican and then sort of our global structures, they are the ones that almost seem to need to be dissipating so that the individual themselves can come forward, maybe within the, a, a formal tradition such as Christianity or Judaism or Islam even, but almost outside of the institutions themselves. And, and it, do you see that as part of the Easter Sunday uh, movement? Yes, I do. Uh, we know there's been a lot of corruption in the church, as there is that can be in each of us. But the church bringing together people who are 
professedly committed to spreading the message of Christ and of being faithful to it. Nevertheless, they're human beings and they are sometimes corrupt. They get attracted by power, they get attracted by authority. And uh, we've seen the type of scandals that have emerged. This has led millions of people to lose any confidence and any trust in the church authorities. There remains nevertheless always the path of the personal search whether it's uh, through prayer and reflection or studying the scriptures or small groups. And uh, I think there's always hope. I would say that for me, the, the, the three days of Easter are called the Triduum, the three day Good Friday, e uh, Holy Saturday, and then Easter Sunday. Good Friday is this uh, sorrowful day of absolute pain and rejection of all hope, uh, apparently. Saturday is a day of silence. It's a day when even uh, according to theology, Jesus is dead, but he's still living according to our teaching and harrowing hell. But it's a silent day. It's the sort of silent day in the middle of the year, in the middle of the world. And then the light comes on the morning of Easter Sunday with a great mystery as well, because the tomb is empty. And uh, Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb to uh, wash the body. They hadn't had time on Friday evening. They buried him hastily. And she finds that their stone is rolled back and there's no body. And she goes and tells the other disciples and they're kind of thinking, well, she must be wrong. She maybe went to the wrong place. And Peter and John then run to the tomb and they say, in scripture, John writes this later, the gospel of John he says, the younger man ran faster. And he got to the tomb before Peter, but he waited at the entrance till Peter caught up. And then they both looked inside and they see the cloths kind of crumpled on the stone where the body had been laying. And they see a little round cloth separate, which is what we believe was uh, the, 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 sh the shroud of Turin, we believe is that, that uh, shroud that was all crumpled and then the little thing that was separate in sort of a circle, we believe is the, what we later will call Veronica's veil or the oh, veil yeah. that picked up the image of Christ's face and perhaps is identifiable now with the veil in Manopello, Italy, which is increasingly being investigated as a very strange image of a man's face with various bruises on his face in a little village in the center of Italy, a very small village of less than a thousand people. So according to our teaching, this Easter Sunday is the beginning of the renewal of, of the world and the universe in a sense and of humanity. Mary in a sense is the second Eve and Jesus in a sense is the second Adam, the new founder of the human race, but no longer bound to the earth, but having certain both human, obviously fully human, and also divine character. So our condition is greater and better than it was or would have been if that fall had not occurred. The, um, the church being corrupt as it carries forward this message is a terrible burden. But again, I, may I quote from the catechism about the end of all? Yeah. After there is a tremendous persecution, which we call the persecution of the Antichrist. Paragraph 677, the church will enter the glory of the kingdom only through this final Passover, when she will follow her Lord in his death and resurrection. The kingdom will be fulfilled. Then, not by a historic triumph of the church, through a progressive ascendancy. So the church doesn't become the governing class of the world and introduce all its laws, no. But only by God's victory over the final unleashing of evil, which will cause his bride to come down from heaven. God's triumph over the revolt of evil will take the form of the last judgment after the final cosmic upheaval of this passing world. Well, 
there's all sorts of ways we could take this, but the first thing we might say is that we are in an in-between period. <coughs> me. which, which I would say is is how you beautifully describe it. it's Holy Saturday. We were in that silent period, are we not? I mean, we the the institutions themselves, even in, in Jesus' time, we saw how corrupt that was. You had Rome, you had the the Pharisaicals uh, element, and and he wasn't in, you know, he was representing, and then he's crucified and, and you hit that Saturday period where, okay, I can't put my trust in the institutions yet. I don't know, you know, that's almost seems like where we are, is it not? I think so. Um, it's a paradox. I, I could quickly summarize this history of the church, which is now 2000 years old. And it's almost in four parts, almost 500 years each, but not quite. The first part really is 283 years from the death of Jesus until the Emperor Constantine, the church was persecuted. Emperor after emperor said, this is a threat to our power. They have another Lord and they refused to worship the emperor as a God. This was the kind of gnarly and, uh, and uh, unbending uh, element in the Christian faith, but the emperors disliked it very much and they executed anyone who wouldn't offer incense to them because they felt that they were politically dangerous. In 313, so after 280 years, they accepted Christianity. And then late in the 300s, they made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. And that is the reason the Christian church inherited the mantle of the Roman Empire. It continued another thousand years in two parts. The first was the Dark Ages, when monasticism grew and many tribes flooded Europe and Vikings came in. The next was the rebirth in the high middle ages that led all the way to the Renaissance, which is what we call Christendom. And it was that time where the crusades occurred. And then we've got the past 500 years from 1500 till today, where the church, which had in some sense become preeminent in Western culture was contested again. First, there was the tremendous division with the Protestants where Northern Europe became Protestant and the Southern Europe remained Catholic. There's an old phrase where they drank beer, they went Protestant, where they drank wine, they stayed Catholic. <laughs> but uh, by the 18th century, the late American Revolution, French Revolution, late 1700s, man kind or European man is becoming humanistic and is leaving in a sense behind this soaring vision of man's identification through Christ with the divine. And they change the divine to reflect science and reason. And that's where we've been for the last 200 years. And science and reason, not just for knowing things, but for having power over things. This is the Faustian deal we've made. And this is why we now find ourselves more powerful than ever, but in many ways more unhappy than ever. We think we control nature. We've investigated, dissected it. We've looked into it and we've used the energies of it, but um, we don't find ourselves in harmony with it. It's a very explosive mixture in the nuclear bomb. It's a very dangerous, Thing for our genetic code and all these vibrations that are passing through us. So we're actually ignorant of very many things and the pride of our science and the ignorance of the possible effects has left us in a pitiable condition. Very, very sad condition. Well, I think it's interesting because I don't know if you've ever seen that, that famous t-shirt, but on the front it says, uh, God is dead, Nietzsche. And then when you go by and you look at the back of the t-shirt, it says Nietzsche is dead, God. Um, so it, it almost seems where you've described or up to around the 1900s, uh, the change of the, into the 20th century, but it almost seems, and again, I will go back to the, the, the Holy Saturday. So I think even now, I mean, people now are questioning science. So, so that, so it almost seems we're in that period again of a Holy Saturday. And, and again, I think this is where the the joy and and the potential for Easter Sunday comes because it's going to be it's always been different. We've never really known what was going to come. First, the church had all the answers, and then science has all the answers. And now it's now now I think there's an uncertainty into all of those various disciplines, and and so it's a little more wide open. Uh, again, I think that's that's where the joy comes. 
Well, I do, I do think that uh, all of the attempts we make to create a paradise without that mystery that's sacred and holy fall short. So we've got people now think they can live 500 or 1,000 or 2,000 years, but they forget that they're going to be always in time. They're never going to change the consciousness itself to connect with the divine or the holy or the eternal. So they'll go on and on and on. And every year there'll be basketball tournaments or there'll be a trip to Cancun. And they may have all sorts of pleasures for 500 or a thousand years, but at a certain moment, somebody will recognize that they're far short of what their true longing is, which is a connection with the divine and with the eternal and with the holy. And they'll say all of this that we've done still isn't satisfying. So this is, I think, my, my, my concept is that the ancients knew this, they told us this, the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Well, the, by fear, they mean a type of reverence. Yeah, reverence, right? Yeah, <clears throat> and um, we have a society that doesn't have any fear. We want to dissect anything, even human embryos, and revise them and, and improve them. But, and, and I am, I do think that medical science does wonderful things, but the attitude we have toward it is a Promethean attitude that we are the protagonists. We've lost all sense that there are certain things that we ought not to do, certain taboos or boundaries that we ought not to pass because it's very harmful and will uh, have unintended effects. And well, yeah. And so I was just gonna say, uh, we're gonna throw the ball in the hour, but you've been around, as I, as I said in the intro, the sort of front row to all of this. And when we get back after the break, I wanna kind of follow your own personal journey because I do think we all live out these journeys that we see like Jesus in Holy Week, but we live them in these out personally. We're sort of cells of the larger body. So when we get back, I wanna hear about Dr. Robert Moynihan's journey and, and uh, we'll get into that in the second half. Hi, and welcome back to Mind to Heart with your host, Craig Richardson, and my good friend and guest, Dr. Robert Moynihan. Again, you can reach me at craigerichardson.com and uh, Bob Moynihan at insidethevatican.com. So, Bob, before the break, uh, we were getting into some of these fairly deep theological uh, issues and things that came out of Holy Week, and as I indicated that you know, we are, we are personally having our own journey that Jesus did. And so I'd like to begin with you and your journey. As I mentioned in the intro, you are from New England, and we have, have that in common. I think we are also both English and Irish descent, and so we have that as well. And you were at Harvard um, I th around the time that my brother was and my father went there. So we, 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 our paths have crossed a lot. But why don't you sort of begin in, in, in Connecticut and kind of, kind of tell us what kind of upbringing you had. And obviously the church must have been very important, but can you start there in, in uh, Storer, Connecticut? I can begin with a memory of my father who was Irish Catholic. My mother was New England wasp Protestant, but my mother converted when she met and married my dad in the 1950s. Not an untypical story. My mom actually descended from people who were on the Mayflower and uh, including the elder William Brewster. So I'm descended from him and Roger Williams who founded Providence, Rhode Island. But the Good Friday in Connecticut, maybe the first days of April, my father went outside at noon with a missile and he started to turn the pages and he, put a little music on in some way, I guess a record player, Gregorian chant. Mm. And I was going to go outside to see if I could bother him and do something with him. And I must have been five years old. And my mother said, don't bother your father. It's Good Friday. And he likes to be alone from noon until three, which is the time Jesus hung on the cross. And this was a tradition among many believing Irish Catholics that you really consecrate the hours of Good Friday to a reflection on the sacrifice made by Christ of his own life. 
So my father sat there and I'm kind of looking out the window and he's kind of reading and the music was playing. And that gave me a paradigm or a, a frame to understand the search that we make in human life. And there's a phrase called uh, sequela Christi, the following of Christ. Later, my father gave me different religious books and he encouraged me to uh, study the, the, the teaching of the church and the lives of the saints, yes. first in little children's versions. So we were raised in that old 1950s style Catholicism, which is so familiar by to many people written the subject of many books. On the good side, it gave a kind of lofty vision. And some people have talked about the bad side where there's a type of neurosis and scrupulosity and, and kind of a, could be a fear of, uh, a fear yeah, of maybe, God. Maybe escape too, there was a way that, you know, they weren't dealing with their issues and. So, um, so that's the matrix out of which I constructed myself and my life. I uh, went to school and then uh, did well and uh, did a lot of running as a cross country runner and uh, a lot of reading, what books like Tolkien. And I, um, I um, ex was accepted into college at Harvard. I went there, I, I was not very happy. I was challenged, and uh, I thought there wasn't a lot of emphasis on the on the ultimate questions. Although perhaps it was it was partly in me, but it was all about establishing your credentials to become a lawyer or a doctor. Get into. A I was also going to mention because I was you know, fifteen minutes from. I grew up in Brookline, which is fifteen minutes from my brother. There is class of seven. You were seventy five, right? Yes. Yeah, my brother is seventy six, and I was going to also ask you from somebody who's you know with with that kind of powerful image of your dad that I mean I remember the Harvard Square in the 70s I mean that was not a time where you were going to be walking around reading a missile on Good Friday I mean, they, yeah. I mean my brother had hair down to here and yeah. uh, he's, he's a lot shorter now but it was that was kind of a crazy time there I mean everybody he still had a little of that 60s left over but but it, the, the more traditional stuff so what was that like well I mean I, I spent really my my whole formative youth engaged with and uh, fighting against what I felt was a, a kind of a departure from the right path. I thought, well, it's, they're right, people are right to want peace, for example, there was all the demonstration against the Vietnam War, but they were swearing and cursing and, you know, uh, I thought, well, so there were pro, uh, pro-peace Catholics that I liked, like Dorothy Day. I went and visited her in New York City before she died. And I feel that I bring that aspect as well so that I'm difficult to define. I'm certainly a person with a great reverence for all the tradition that the church carried. But I'm also, I was educated in these secular universities, both Harvard and Yale. And I realized the arguments that can be made for the aspects that were so-called benighted or uh, the closing of the Catholic mind and then the efforts that the Catholics made to, to be accepted in academia and among all the disciplines and as, as historians and scientists, they, and then including in politics, starting with the Kennedys, the, the country uh, had an ambivalent attitude toward Catholics and Catholics had an ambivalent attitude toward themselves. So that, that was, uh, yeah, it was uh, like an oyster gets a grain of sand in, inside its shell and starts to be irritated by it. I was irritated by the contradiction between the faith that I really felt my father had handed to me and that I needed to preserve and this world of, of opportunity and uh, and attractiveness but also great great shortcomings and year by year the oyster tries to generate a type of substance which it places around the grain of sand because it's still irritating but by putting this kind of 
creamy like substance, which is first very soft and then hard is it creates a pearl. That's where pearls come from. Mm -hmm. So I had this problem of reconciling the faith with modernity and everything that I've done is a reaction to that. And I eventually knew, first I decided to try to see if people lived a simpler life and I lived with the Amish. A family mm -hmm. took me in, in Burdenham, Pennsylvania. And I didn't graduate from Harvard until 77 because I left for a year and a half. And you were on the, you were the Amish for a year and a half. Well, no, I was only with them for about half a year. And the man that I stayed with just died recently. His name was Moses. And Moses Stoltzfus was, a, was very welcoming, but he always said, you know, you're very deluded because you've been, you know, in the world. He said, now that you're with us, you must leave the world behind. And he would introduce me to the neighbors and they'd say, who's this? And they'd go, this is Bob Moynihan. He's from the world. He's from the world. <laughs> Did you have a business I, card that said, I'm Bob from the world? or Yeah. So I left, uh, really, on the eve of my 21st birthday, I left him. I said, I got to go back. Uh, my parents expect it. But I, too, have unfinished business. I've got to engage it and somehow overcome it. And so I went back, got a degree. And a key figure was Walker Percy, an American Catholic author, who helped me to understand the predicament of modern man as enamored by behavioralism and by his understanding of all things uh, material as the key to our existence, but his unhappiness with that answer because always we have an aspiration for what transcends that. So my, the matrix of my thinking was shaped in part by him. I wrote my thesis on him and then I went, became a newspaper reporter. I couldn't get any other job. <laughs> learned, how to, learned how to write articles daily. And uh, one day I was at a school board meeting in Ellington, Connecticut. And after the meeting, I was talking with the school board chairman and she looked at me and said, you know, what are you doing? You are better than this. You're, you're working on this little local paper. You should go to graduate school. And it was as if uh, an oracle had spoken to me. I said, you know, maybe, maybe, I'm, maybe this isn't my final stop. I had in my mind, that I would go to Hartford and then to Providence and then to the Boston Globe and then to the New York Times. That would be my career. God, God puts people in in our paths, does, does he not? When uh, when you most yeah. need them, and that that pearl of wisdom, right time, I guess. Well, I, I sent the letter to Yaroslav Pelikan at Yale. I said, I've been reading your books. I'd like to study the history of Christian thought from the ancient world up until the early modern period. So I want to apply for the medieval studies period between these periods to study with you. And he wrote me back. He said, I want you to be my student. Oh, well, that, well that's amazing. We're, we're going to come up on, on our final break because I, what I really want to do is to spend our, our last time sort of Yale and, and then mostly into your experiences with the founding of the, of the, of the magazine and, and, and then again, what you saw on that. Well, I, I got to meet right. all the popes, John Paul and Benedict and talked with them. So it was quite an interesting. Yeah, I don't want to run out of time on that end because it's, it, that's, that's, and that's a great uh, part of your life as well. So why don't we take a, a, a break now? And again, uh, my uh, website is craigerichardson.com and um, you can reach Dr. Moynihan at Inside the Vatican Dot com and we'll pick you up on the other side of the break. Thank you. Welcome back to Mind to Heart with your host, Craig Richardson, and I'm honored to have my good friend and guest, Dr. Robert Moynihan. Uh, Bob, before uh, we got took the break we were you had just written to a professor at Yale so why don't, why don't we pick up with that because I think that's this last segment I really you know sir your things really really opened up for you so why don't, why don't we start there with the letter to the professor yeah I suppose each of us has various fathers and I had my father in the garden on Good Friday and Yaroslav Pelikan became my doctor father as they call it in German uh, my teacher father and he was from Chicago, from a Czech and I think Czech and Serb background. His father had, had become a Lutheran minister and his mother was Orthodox, Serbian Orthodox, I believe. And 
he knew from an early age German and he knew, uh, I think, uh, Serbian. And then he studied Latin, Greek, Hebrew and became a scholar. And by the end, he had studied Syriac and other, of course, French and Italian and Spanish. And he knew 17 languages. It was a standard. It was like going up, say, if you're a baseball player with a Hank Aaron or Mickey Mantle or somebody. I, uh, and, the, and he was a believing Christian. He was an ordained minister, but he wasn't a Catholic, but he thought in terms of the Catholic in the small C, the Catholic community that he identified by three characteristics, we, which he took from Isidoro Seville. What we have all believed in all times, everywhere. These were the, the characteristics of orthodox doctrine. And he wrote books on the development of doctrine that he published in five volumes called the, the uh, I have a copy here, the development, I think it's the, 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 the Christian tradition, the development of doctrine. And he takes it century by century from the time of Christ right up to the present day. So that's what I studied. And um, he said to me, uh, you're, you've, you're, you're, you're from a Catholic background, you should study the Catholic Church and you should see how your church does some things very well and th then what some of the uh, problems with the church are and you could be a figure that helps to reconcile the Catholics with the Orthodox and with the Protestants. He said, you should go to Rome, you should learn Italian, you should work in the Vatican Library, choose a dissertation topic that will take you there and I'll help you. So I, cho I chose a topic in the middle of the Middle Ages having to do with St. Bonaventure, a great, a great theologian, and how he interpreted the mission of St. Francis of Assisi into the scriptural uh, prophecy of the coming of the Holy Spirit, which had been spoken of a lot by the Calabrian abbot Joachim of Fiore, who lived uh, in the 1100s. So this was a whole universe that I entered into when I landed in Rome without hardly any, I, I had someone teach, tutor me in Italian, and I had to learn it very slowly with difficulty. And it took me years, five years, I would say. But uh, I was fascinated and I walked across St. Peter's Square that very first summer, 1984, and I saw a man that I had seen on television the night before speaking as uh, the prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith to Leonardo Boff, and the name was Joseph Ratzinger, but Pope by... Benedict who later became Pope Benedict. By pure coincidence, he had been a scholar on the topic of how Bonaventure used the writings of Joachim. Oh my God, that's a pretty narrow. It was the exact same topic. And so I had, oh got, I had picked up a book in America, which I had in my briefcase, without Theology of History in St. Bonaventure by Joseph Ratzinger. And I pulled it out of my briefcase. I, I said, excuse me, are you Joseph Ratzinger? And he said, yes, I am. And that's how I met him. And I said, well, this is your book. I've been reading it. It's helped me enormously as I'm studying Bonaventure and how he used Joachim's thought. i going over to the library right now. He said, yeah, our paths are crossing because I'm going over to my office at the congregation. He said, come by every so often. But I must tell you, you're the only one in Rome who's read that book of mine. <laughs> because everything else that everyone in Rome was reading was about the, the modern crisis and the Second Vatican Council, because he was very influential there. But I hadn't even heard of him except in that book. So I went to the Vatican with no knowledge of modern Vatican affairs. But I became fascinated after that encounter, and uh, I also ran completely out of money. <laughs> so I went and said to myself, I can try to write something because I'd been a newspaper reporter. I, and I got a little paper in Rome called the International Courier to give me $15 for each article. I said, will you let me cover the Vatican? He said, okay, you got it. So I said, can I write two articles a day? And he said, if there's interesting material, you can do so. And that is how I became a Vatican journalist.
as I was supposed to work on my dissertation, I would slip out of the library and go talk to some cardinal or some minister general of a religious order. And I'd say, what are you doing behind the Iron Curtain? Because it was the 80s, the Iron Curtain was still up. Yeah. And I went to Budapest, you know, where, where there was a big conference on religion in the uh, East Bloc. And uh, I was then therefore torn in two directions and only with difficulty after postponing for five years and starting my journalism in Rome, did I turn back and finish the dissertation. But I did finally complete it and I got the degree from Yale as a doctor of philosophy. But my heart had really shifted into no longer the Middle Ages, but what I call this modern time of our lifetime, which probably will be regarded as the Middle Age a thousand years from now. Because we almost call postmodern modernism, right? Almost postmodern, but but so but so limited and silly in so many ways, and so bedeviled by by foolish. Uh, uh, what do we call them? Politically correct thought that you can't, you're not allowed to even raise an objection. I think in the Middle Ages, they may have been more free than we are in some ways. Because if you went to Paris as Bonaventure and Thomas Aquinas was there, and then there were people favoring the Islamic scholars, Averroes and Avicenna, they were debating night and day. There was a tremendous debate going on. Yeah, I, and, I, and I think that's why it's important that you keep writing. I mean, I think, you know, that's, we, we, you know, and we have, both of us have that connection to the American founding and everything. And it's important just to keep, I mean, just keep talking. So uh, we yeah. only have about three minutes left and I want to, I want to kind of hit some, some highlights. So you, you, so you, and I know that you're, you know, continue to be friends with, with Pope Benedict. Uh, I even saw him recently, but he was just so old now that I didn't want to raise questions about pole, of a polemical nature, but I saw him again recently. Well, I'm sure just the visit, because it sounds like, you know, if I, if I wrote my thesis on something like that and ran into a, st a young student or wrote a book and, you know, you probably won him over just, just there. Uh, yeah. Uh, we were friendly. Yeah, uh, there's a mystery in 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 the relate. What happened to the Catholic Church? I think we became trendy. Uh, what's happened to our world? I think we've fallen into the trap. Uh, th they said in the Roman Empire that six men controlled the entire grain supply of, from Egypt of that, that that fed most of the Roman Empire. Well, we've got a half a dozen people who are, have hundreds of billions of dollars. The gap between the wealthy and the poor is perhaps never been so great. And people, when they have power and influence, they, they tend to spread their thoughts and their ideas. And they have this vision of transforming humanity now in some way to humanity 2.0 or homo sapiens 2.0 with chips and with better genetic code, et cetera. But nobody is reminding us that our soul is our life and our breath and it's what gives us love. It's what gives us courage. It's what was formed by your by your early years and by your studies and by the things your sufferings. This is the journey of a soul, and uh, the loss of the soul. Walker Percy talks about this, and uh, Benedict, Pope Benedict, Joseph Ratzinger, and Yaroslav Pelikan. They're, they're sort of my three fathers. My father in the garden my father at Yale studying medieval history, and then my father in Rome who became the Holy Father, Pope Benedict, but he was also- Well, we only have a little less than a minute, and, and I, I want to do remind you because the, the words that saying that uh, the pen is mightier than the sword, and you've been a journalist your whole time. Um, so it, 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 all of us need to speak into that void because you know, there are things that we, we cherish. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I think you've, you've lived a life like that. Do you have any final comments in the last 20 seconds or so that you want to leave? Us? I think of myself and I think each of us is a link in a long chain, one link before us stretched our ancestors and all those who came before us and struggled and worked and prayed and sacrificed and gave us what we have. And we, want to hand down to those who come after some part of what we have been given and received with such with such tenderness and uh, this tenderness is i think the, the 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 heart of love and this is what we want to give to the future and this is our task as christians and as human beings
Well, well, thank you. I want to thank you so much, Bob. It's been a wonderful hour. Again, I could have spent a couple more with you and, and I appreciate it and have a holy and blessed Easter. And thanks for joining me. Thank you very much, Craig. Best to you and best to everyone. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Mind to Heart with me, Craig Richardson. My path has led me from the Protestant and Catholic churches, as well as studies in alchemy, mediumship, Eastern philosophy, and most recently, Edgar Cayce and transpersonal psychology. As an intuitive life coach, I am ready to guide you to an amazing life. For more information about me, visit craigerichardson.com.